Welcome everyone to another installment of Talent Wars. My name is Len Perna. I'm the chairman and CEO of Turnkey ZRG, uh, which is the sports and entertainment and music division of ZRG, which is a global talent advisory firm. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled today to have the CEO of Rise with me, Diane Billings Buford. And before I pass the ball to her, I want to just talk just for a moment on what Rise is. For anyone that doesn't know it, Rise uh, was set up a number of years ago, and I'm very happy to report that I was involved in the launch of Rise. It is a national nonprofit, and it is in, in business and in existence to educate and empower around the issues of inclusion in sports and the sports business. It has an extremely high profile board of directors and Diane is the CEO. And Diane is gonna first start by telling us a little bit about what Rise is doing. Diane, it's so great to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's always great to hang out with you, Lynn, even virtually. Um, you know, what is Rise doing now? I think, you know, it's funny. I was just talking to the staff. Uh, we, we see the world changing, right? Since 2020 and the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, um, we reposition ourselves at that time. Uh, and, and as any good organization, we are adjusting for this time now. I think we're seeing a different time. We're seeing more backlash. And a lot of what Rise is doing now is not only how do we continue to help our partners figure out how to operationalize inclusion, but we're continuing to educate on these issues that impact inclusion. Um, we're helping organizations continue to figure out what is their vision of inclusion for their organization? What do they want the future and the present to look like? And then we help them take the steps to do that and to get there. And so that's where we are now. And uh, you know, I make it sound simple, but it's it's not simple. Like I said, we're at a time of intense disagreement over some of these issues. Um, and you know, I, I'm proud that Rise is always looking at this from a, a lens of inclusion and unity. Um, and so it, it does, the intense disagreement does make it a little bit more challenging for us to say we want to talk about inclusion, but in a unifying way. But we still believe that that's possible. And maybe just for some of our listeners, talk about one or two concrete examples of maybe who the clients are, the clients teams. Are they departments of athletics in the college space? Are they leagues? Give us a couple, just one or two concrete examples of, of the good work you guys are doing. Absolutely. So the answer to your question is yes. The one thing that, you know, when we looked at uh, our mission, one of the things when I came on and you said, Rise, it's been uh, a little while ago, you helped to establish it. That was seven years ago now, uh, going on eight, Lynn. It does and not I seem have, like seven years, I can tell you that. Yeah, That's no, it really is almost eight in October. And in September, I will have been CEO for five years. So it's, you know, time is passing. It is passing quickly. Um and, and when I came on, we really looked at our mission and we said, OK, let us go back and hone this mission so that we make sure we are reaching success when, when we get there. Um, we were clear that we are here to educate and empower. We were clear that we are here to unify. We were here that we are here, to, that our work is to make tomorrow better than today. Um, we narrowed our focus on a lot of things, but one of the things we would not narrow our focus on was our audience. And so to your question, we believe that we are educating and empowering the entire sports community. So I am proud that our target this year is to have 100 multi-week programs that is generally done with youth. For us, youth is middle schoolers and high schoolers. Uh, that can look like our Building Bridges with Basketball program that is sponsored by Under Armour, um, is supported by the NBA, and it's happening in 13 cities across the country. But youth always also looks like we just launched, I believe it is our fifth Rise with the Ram program that the Ram sponsor uh, with really diverse high schools from different um, schools in Southern California. Uh, engaging with our curriculum over multiple weeks, generally any place from six to 10 weeks at a time. Um, so we have our youth audience, we have our collegiate space, we've got some really great partnerships I think I say Val Ackerman's name uh, 20 times a day. I just think she is one of the great, you know, female leaders in the sports space of our time. 
Um, and so with Val uh, over at the Big East, we have a multi-year partnership with them. So we're engaging with all 11 of their membership institutions um, and providing programming with those schools. Um, and then we do quite a lot of work uh, with the professional athletic space. Um, and we do quite a lot of work internally with organizations and then working with them on the external pieces as well. And that could look like, I think last year at NASCAR, we, um, between our digital learning, our virtual learning and our in-person sessions, over 1200 folks in the NASCAR organization did multiple trainings with us. Um, it can look like trainings we do with the NFL. Uh, we just launched a really, I shouldn't say just, we're on our second or third year now, partnership with SailGP, which is a fairly new racing league that's coming out, focusing in the sailing space. So yes to all those, because we say the sports community and we mean the entire sports community. And, and Diane, maybe just another minute or two on something that you and I have worked together on. So you actually have a full-time marketing partnerships expert on your staff, Zoe, and, and, and you are crafting programs, putting together custom programming for the anheuser Bushes of the world, the Pepsis of the world. And, and so I think it's important for any corporate partners or agencies that are listening out there that, that there, there aren't things like off the shelf that you're, you're working on companies with. You're creating things for these companies. Maybe give us one example of that. Yeah, I will say a great uh, three years ago, you know, you you referenced my board and my board is very high powered, but my board is also very male dominated. Um, and so two years into my tenure, you know, we said at the staff level, we are going to be intentional and we are going to do more in the space of women's sports. Um, and so we really pride ourselves. We have made great strides since then. And last weekend or two weekends ago, I'm getting my weekends confused, two weekends ago, uh, with you, you mentioned Pepsi. So with Starry, which is one of Pepsi's newest brands, we had a critical conversation at the WNBA All-Star uh, Weekend. Was super excited about that. And to your point, it meant we needed to sit with the WNBA, sit with Starry. What are we aiming to do? What is the exact topic? Because for us, for critical conversations, we don't, I don't mind folks talk, having general conversations, but that's not the goal of a critical conversation. We are saying, what is the issue that we're going to talk about? How are we going to educate folks? How are we going to really empower people? This should be a solutions-oriented discussion. And sometimes it's public-facing, as it was at the WNBA All-Star a couple of weeks ago. And sometimes they're internal. There are times when we are having those critical conversations only inside of a team or only inside of a league. And we are addressing specific issues we are educating on topics and skills that we think would be really helpful to those issues. And we're trying to come up with solutions. So if you're if you're out there, if you're a brand, if you're an agency, if you are interested in this space, um, you know, reach out to Rise because we can craft programs for you. And I know that that's one of the things yeah. that we've built our staff around to, to custom create these programs. So let's talk a little bit and about- I just want to add in, this is a great thing for brands. I mean, Aja Wilson, I think it has also allowed brands to get some of the biggest names to authentically and truly want to engage in your brand in a public way. Um, you know, I, I look back last Super Bowl this this year, feels like last year now. Um, but I look back and, you know, Garrett Wilson, who then literally two days later, uh, became the offensive rookie of the year, uh, engaged with us through uh, Pepsi and Invesco, um, I, I believe. Um, you know, I, I think for brands, it is, I think we are a great partner because so many of the athletes of all races, those two folks happen to be African-American, but so many of the athletes want to speak authentically. And I think we have been able with brands to craft conversations and engagements that make sense for your brand and really truly speaks to the athlete. And, and by the way, study after study shows that people nowadays are looking for brands that are willing to make a statement, get behind a cause, stand for something, say what you stand for and not simply be vanilla uh, to, to everyone. And so to anybody yep. that's out there, 
Um, this is a place where you can craft programs with RISE. So yeah. Diane, let's get to what, like to me, the, the sort of the foundational question that I think a lot of people have difficulty sort of organizing in their mind is sort of the difference between equity and equality. How, how would you address that? Yeah, I love that. So uh, when I said Rise Educates, we really are built on a pretty firm foundation of curriculum. Uh, we have, I would say, over 50 modules, give or take. Um, and one of the topics that we, or one of the subjects that we often cover is equity versus equality. We think these are the types of conversations people need to be having so that when you're trying to make difficult decisions or you're trying to have difficult conversations with one another, you really are using the same terms the same way. Um, and so in that session, one of the things we really focus on is they are both, they are both literally ways to go about fairness. That, that, that is what they both are. And so one says we literally give everyone, we treat everyone exactly the same. That's equality. And one says, we are focused more on creating the same outcomes for everyone, right? And that does not necessarily mean you give everyone the same thing. When we are having this discussion with our youth, uh, which we do, we believe in having all of these topics at all levels. Um, one of the things I think that really resonates with them is we say, equality is giving everyone a pair of shoes, right? You're all here, you're playing sports together, everyone needs footwear. Equality is giving everyone a pair of shoes. Equity is giving everyone the pair of shoes in their size, right? Because the outcome is that everyone will be able to play with the same level equipment and be able to be as effective as they possibly could as individuals. So, you know, that's a distinction that we make. You know, um, we can always make more progress. And, and I think everyone in the sports industry feels like we need to make more progress um, and then something like the Supreme Court ruling comes down, which did, you know, about a month ago. And so maybe we can just start at the beginning for anyone who isn't following what the Supreme Court ruled recently on affirmative action. Uh, Diane, tell us what was the ruling? Yeah, the ruling was basically the Supreme Court said that affirmative action um, programs at public and private collegiate institutions um, were invalidated under the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, and they said, because just so you know, the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment basically comes along with three tests, a test that has like three prongs. And uh, in their estimation, the schools had failed every prong of the test. Um, equal protection requires that there is uh, an end to uh, whatever you put in place. Equal protection requires that if you make a plan um, that has that at all impacts a protected class, um, it cannot impact that protected class negatively, right? Based on stereotypes or whatever. Um, and then it says that they must comply with a pretty strict um, scrutiny test um, and should have like compelling governmental um, focus. Um, and so that's what the, the court decided, right? And it really was a decision that was made towards schools, affirmative action. Um, and it, it basically just says every, every, what do you call it? Applicant just needs to be treated like an, like an individual. Now it doesn't say that a person's race is not a part of their identity and that you cannot take into account their experiences that may have been impacted by race. It doesn't say I think say it that actually you. specifically said that you can and you can. should look at yes. the life experiences of that person and, and how they might be affected by their race, for example. Exactly. Um, so so it's, it's interesting, right? Like, what does that mean? It, it says you can take into account, you know, what Diane experienced as a, a black person from Brooklyn, New York, and a woman as well, right? So let's the race, gender, you can take all those things into account, um, but you can't admit me because I'm black, or maybe they're saying you can't not admit someone else because they're white or Asian. So we'll see. And 
And, and this was a ruling in the higher education sphere. Um, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, whether or not this ruling, you know, has applicability to, you know, the teams, the leagues, all, all of us here in, on the, in, as private employers uh, who are right. not educational institutions, does this, in fact, potentially apply to us? So no, directly. Directly, it does not apply to us, right? Like employment, private employment in particular, is not covered by the Equal Protections Clause. It's not covered by the, the 14th Amendment at all, right? We're covered by Title VII, I believe, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, that being said, as you could imagine, right? Like both of these laws are built on our country's belief, right? On equal opportunity. Um, and so, no, it does not impact our uh, industry and how we hire and anybody else's industry, quite honestly, when you're talking about private institutions and how they hire um, directly. That being said, we've seen already in the news, right? Like there are a number of places that are already getting EEOC claims and they're those that believe that this is the beginning of having these discussions um, and, and making sure that we get court cases that, that lead up, if necessary, to the Supreme Court um, looking at this law. Now, it is worth saying that Justice, um, why am I forgetting his name, one of the newer justices, it doesn't mean I'm not a fan of his, yes it does, <laughs> um, <Kavanaugh. laughs> uh, he did explicitly, he explicitly brought up uh, Title VII of, um, in his concurring opinion. Uh, but it is a concurring opinion. It is not a conclusion. It is not a conclusion of the, the court, nor was it really clear. Um, so it would be silly for us to ignore that there are those that might see these two issues as connected and that this might be a precursor to some of those suits, but they are wholly different and one is not applicable to the other. Well, and we, you know, there's a lot of lawyers in this country and there's a lot of very creative lawyers that like to try to take one ruling yep. in one sphere and see if they can leverage it into a ruling in a different sphere. So, so let, let's just, and, and certainly the court's composition has changed dramatically. And, and I think the polarization of the United States shows that things are different than, you know, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years ago when this ruling might not have come down. So, so now that this ruling is there, what is the strategy that uh, private employers and you know we're in the sports business so let's just think about us in the sports business if you're if you're running and own a team uh, if you're a general counsel or you're trying to think about how to you know manage human capital in the environment of a sports business what are the strategies that you would suggest people be thinking about well I think there are two things I I want to say I think the most important message that I need to send and I have been sending because folks have been asking this question is what you need to focus on you have been focusing on already so most of the de and I plans um, that I have seen at the different clubs and at the different uh, leagues they're always based on inclusion and fairness from the beginning and that is what the law requires. So I, I think it is really important to say that at the top. Folks need to actually get less concerned because you've been doing this. This is, lawyers have been involved with the creation of these plans, have been flagging things for you, and it, you're probably fine. Um, most of our inclusive language, right, that all none of us think about anymore, that we literally, we put on all of our postings it talks about inclusion and folks will not be discriminated against because of X, Y, Z. So most of our plans have already been built on what the law requires from an inclusion and fairness standpoint. I don't think it, I don't think it hurts anyone to go ahead and inventory what you have and take a good look at your programming, but take a good look with the understanding that you are more than likely fine. Um, and, and very much within the constructs of, of any law and totally, within the constructs of Title VII of the Civil Rights um, Clause of 1964, because literally that's what lawyers have been looking at since we have been building these DEI programs. Um, and I say that not only from my perch at Rise Now, but before that I was at the Time Warner, Time Warner the company. 
Um, and so I sat in corporate social responsibility, the same, my boss oversaw that and diversity and inclusion, right? I have lived in this corporate space and diversity and inclusion plans. And so I know for a fact, this is what we were always looking at. So I think that's the top message. Then the next message I would say is, I actually think it's gonna, this, this court ruling and how we see certain conservative organizations moving to bring some suits, I think actually, I hope it will push our industry to do some of the things many of us have talked about and have tried and maybe will push us to do them even better, right? We've got to think about where are we sourcing our talent? Um, I get to sit on a board of a foundation with the person who is the dean of the Colin Powell School for, in, in the CUNY system in the city of New York. A CUNY system, you know, and Andy made a great point that there are schools with amazing students that this will never impact because they're majority black and brown students anyway. Um, and so I think it may push us as an industry to say, are we looking everywhere for talent? Um, there is there's nothing that says you can't look at certain schools. So even if we ever got a ruling that said we have to, you know, apply higher scrutiny to how we look at race in hiring. If you change where you were sourcing folks from, if you not only change it, but you expand it, right? We're not talking about cutting anyone out, but truly expand it. It would be a way to reach that, that same outcome that you want with in a little bit less concern about what could change in the law. I mean, you know, one of the people that we have at Turnkey is one of the co-founders of the Black Sports Business Academy, which are people coming out of the HBCUs. And that's a good example of, you know, if you go there and you're looking for young talent that wants to get into sports, you can be confident that you're getting people who are super sharp, that go to great schools. And yes, they, many of them are of color, but that's not the reason you're hiring them. You're hiring them because they're at those HBCUs. That's the qualification you're looking right. for. And I think that's a great example of that. Just one final question. And on, you know, if I could add to that, Lynn, on top of being at the HBCU, they also are folks who have shown an, an interest in your industry enough to join the Black Sports Academy. Right. They they're at the school. They're at a great school, but they also have shown great interest in your industry. They also have shown they want to learn about the industry and they want to spend their time and their talent, like figuring out how to be of value in this industry. So, I mean, they're putting in ex a lot of extra time to get a, a certification basically from this academy that qualifies yeah. them to jump right into, you know, a sports job. I think one of the final things is, you know, we have a vice president of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion here at Turnkey who keeps in touch with a lot of the DEI executives all across the sports industry. And, you know, I think there's there was some concern after the Supreme Court decision that, oh, my gosh, you know, what does this mean for us? And, you know, is this still a role that that sports front offices want to invest in, want to develop, and want to put at a cabinet level where it can be involved in all aspects of a business. So what do you, how can you uh, make people relax about that and feel like that's still a absolutely crucial role to have in any of these organizations? Well, my experience has shown that most of the real, the, the top people at these leagues and these clubs are smart people. Um, I have actually seen that most of them, I'm not saying all of them, um, have shown themselves to be visionary. Um, and I have for sure seen most and all of them want to make money. They want to have the greatest profits possible, right? Um, and we have seen that the organizations that have understood the changing demographic of our country, um, and even globally, not just our country. The organizations that have understood that have been the organizations that have seen some of the greatest increases in revenue over the past four to five years since I've been here. Um, and so the truth is, while most folks don't necessarily like to say it this way, this can be seen, inclusion can be seen as a business initiative. It, it can be seen as how are you making your organization best ready 
to capture the interest and grow your your fan base right and that's i'm not saying we're not here for other reasons but we are businesses this is important um and so i think that smart leaders understand that and because they understand that business imperative and it's not that it's the only business business imperative but because they understand that business imperative um you you, you then have to equip yourself to be able to meet that need right and so I think smart leaders, you're going to see that. I think if we see some short-sighted leaders and we're going to see some short-sighted leaders, but I think at the end of the day, they're, you know, woe unto them. I don't want to get biblical, but, you know, this is like, you you got to make it in this business. You got to increase revenue. You have to increase profit. You you have to craft a vision and you have to craft a vision that makes sense to stakeholders. Um, and so I just think given the changing demographics of our country, given that you know, when we look at the different leagues and we look at who's grown revenue and we look at who's doing well, um, they're pretty out front, out in front. They're pretty intentional uh, in this space and it has generally served them well. And so I, I think, you know, not that they aren't great people, they are great people and they are great business leaders. So, by the way, I love it when you get biblical. I absolutely love that. Well, part. one to them. <laughs> Um, listen, we are at time and it just flies by at 30 minutes. Uh, but I want to thank Diane and, and everybody else that's tuned in today or who will be turning in to take a look at this as we as we cut it up and edit it and, and post it. Um, Diane, you're an expert. You're a subject matter expert. Uh, you're also an expert at creating and nurturing relationships, which is so important in this industry. You're so well respected. Uh, oh, and I have been honored to work with you, to have been there when you were hired uh, is one of the greatest accomplishments of my career. So thank you for being on with us and just thank you for the relationship that you have with our firm. Thank you. Keep doing what you do. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.